is an Unspoiled Network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering the Veronica Mars film from 2014. In this film, it's been nine years, I believe, since the last episode, or eight years. It has... Things have progressed and not in ways that I find surprising, heartwarming, and then by the end, so, so sad. I don't, I, I just, it's a real roller coaster, this one. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Ariel and Rachel for commissioning this episode. This was a joint effort because movies are an hour and a half long episodes, so they're more expensive. And uh, watching a movie takes a lot longer than watching the TV show. So it's uh, really exciting to get to watch this, though. I didn't expect to like it as much as I did. I think that because y'all sort of seem to be very lukewarm on it, that was actually good for me because then I wasn't hyped up too much. And I went into it without expectations real high, which sort of helped everything, I think. Um, and yeah, in the comments here, Rachel and Ariel are talking about my uh, live commenting in the Facebook group for patrons that I was doing while I was watching it. I couldn't resist. There were just so many things that I was like, what? Um so the movie opens with a sort of basic explanation of everything that happened with Veronica in the first season. And it really is primarily the first season that is talked about there. And she gets briefly into her and Logan eventually breaking up. But there's not a lot of talk about exactly why. It's just sort of put down to the fact that they both have rage and trust issues. And... um Look, we just have to get this out of the way now. I'm really bummed out that Veronica gets with Logan. And I feel about this, that were I watching this as who I was in 2014 probably I wouldn't have had such an issue because I'll tell you what I was one of the fucking fools rooting for Carrie and big to get together at the end of season five of sex in the city, which talk about a toxic relationship that should definitely have ended. But I didn't understand that he was such trash until I got older and really knew better. So I feel about Logan the same way that it's treated as this grand love story. And they even talk about how it's this epic story that spans years and decades or, and what does he say? Continents. I don't know how it spans continents, but that's fine. Um, but I, I can definitely see how some people were rooting for the two of them to get together. It's just devastating to watch his get completely sidelined. I would have such a different reaction to Veronica getting back with Logan if Piz weren't in the equation the way that he is. But he is so sweet and supportive and he is really like cool about the fact that she's literally going to help her ex-boyfriend by herself and really doesn't like he doesn't get weird or jealous about it. This is a guy that beat the shit out of him. And he really is genuinely so, so, like, kind. And she just leaves him standing there with his parents after promising to be back in time. And it's the kind of thing that, watching it from the outside, look, she's trying to keep somebody from being, like, basically put on death row for murder. So even if it weren't Logan, this would still be a worthy effort. She's trying to keep somebody from being wrongly convicted of 
the killing of another human being. So really, when you step back and look at the, the overall priorities that she has, she's not wrong. She is prioritizing something that is very urgent and time sensitive. And I get that. But I also, stepping back and looking at Piz's situation, I cannot help but be like, yo, everything he says about how, like, I really wish that I could evoke the same sense of loyalty and priority in you. I was like, I fucking feel you, dude. You know, like, I really get it. There is nothing like feeling that you aren't a priority to the person you're with. And that is something that a lot of us have experienced. And it hurts really badly. And Piz frequently has felt like second fiddle, you know. So this is just devastating. And like I said, if it weren't for Piz, I think that her getting back with Logan would feel a lot more like, well, okay. But because he is so good and trying so hard, it just is like a slap in the face. It really makes me sad. Um, Yeah, Ariel says, after almost a decade of a relationship, too. Exactly. She hadn't even met his parents this whole time, which is frankly just strange. And when she goes to his job, they mention how he's talked about her a lot, but they've never seen her. There's a lot of indicators that she is not involved in his life in the way that one would expect after being together for this long. I don't think they're... Are they living together? I don't remember if that's the situation that she's in or not. Um, Rachel says, I think some of the decisions for this movie were definitely to please the fans and the fans as a whole absolutely loved Logan, especially over Piz. Um, And especially since the fans bankrolled it. Mm, Right, right, right. I don't think Veronica and Piz were together since college, though. I haven't watched the movie recently, but I seem to recall they had broken up and then reunited a few years before the movie. Oh, I didn't catch that. Um, which might be my fault. Maybe if I hadn't been like live commenting while I watched, I wouldn't have missed a thing. My bad. Um, but so I just wanted to get that out of the way because, uh, oh no, I know it was a Kickstarter, Rachel. I just meant that they had broken up and gotten back together. I was thinking like they probably, she mentioned that and I just missed it. Cause there's a lot of like little one sentence summaries of what everybody has been up to. So I wouldn't be surprised if I sort of missed something. Um, But yeah, like I said, I just wanted to get the uh, talk about the elephant in the room because, you know, you all know that I haven't been a fan of Logan and getting back together, especially considering the whole episode or movie is sort of framed around her treating her relationship to him and her thirst for danger as a drug and her addiction, it just feels extra dysfunctional. And it's sort of, I feel like the way they're doing it is they sort of want to have her treat it that way. While on the outside, we're looking at it and not really thinking as strongly in that direction as she is. Like we're meant to be a little bit more compassionate on our view of how she's behaving compared to how she sees herself. But I am not more compassionate. In fact, I think she's dead on in most of her assessments of herself and the like baggage that she has. And yet she still like succumbs in the end, which feels super unhealthy. And it just doesn't feel like a victory. And I, I really think they could have written this in a way where it wasn't so toxic seeming. But they chose to sort of come at it from the direction of her wanting to help Logan and be an investigator is an addiction. And Neptune is a hell hole that will swallow you and not let you leave and ruin your life. And both things seem to come to fruition by the end of the episode. In, I'm going to keep calling it episode. Sorry, guys. I know it's a movie, but I just I can't help but do that. Um, so it just, the, the actual like plot, I actually found pretty compelling, but because they had that overall theming going on, it just lent an air of sadness to it all that 
was a downer. And ma- it, at the end, I just kind of felt like this feels like she's giving up. And I don't really know, you know, so we're going to start from the beginning here. Um, but it all begins with uh, her getting interviewed for a job as a lawyer. And this was shocking in and of itself, because as we all know, she had been trying to get an internship with the FBI and she got that internship. And then I guess she just decided to go left and do something that makes money. It's unclear. I wish that we got a little bit more of a look as to why her life took this turn instead of more of a capitalizing on her investigative abilities turn. Um, Because what, again, if we're going back to the theme, which is (laughs) that Neptune's like ruining your life. Uh, I don't, I think what we're supposed to be taking away from this is she has this very comfortable alternative version of her life that she could be living outside of Neptune that is marked with all the earmarks of what we would consider success. And she is turning it down because it's, it bores her, which is sort of a weird thing because it wasn't what we as viewers had expected her to do anyway. So if she's bored, why did she go in that direction at all? What what caused her to drop the thing that she was actually passionate about? It feels like they're very purposely setting up a false dichotomy where it's either she can continue being an investigator in Neptune or she she goes and is a high powered lawyer in New York. And it's like, there's like a million things she could do. She went to Stanford, you know, she's, she apparently passed the bar. So there is a ton that she could go out and do, but it's sort of like, there's just one other version of her life and it's settle down with Piz, meet his parents, take this high powered job that she obviously hates or come back here to her ex-boyfriend And keep doing this, like, you know, little piecemeal jobs, Mars investigations thing. And it just isn't fair. It's weird to cut out the option of her working for law enforcement when that's clearly the track that she was on by the time the season ended. I don't know if there's a reason behind that or, you know, if there's something that I missed, but it just thought it was an odd thing to do. Um I will say that Jamie Lee Curtis being the one to interview her for this job was a delightful surprise. Um, And there's this moment I had seen, you know, guys, when you are watching something and you finally get to the scene where you didn't realize what a gif was from the entire time and you suddenly get to a scene and you're like, oh, my God, I've seen this in a gif. We have this moment where some dude shows her that he like, drew a penis like an uh uh with like glasses and a suit on or something and she like puts her middle finger up and acts like she's taking the cap off and puts on lipstick with the middle finger and i have seen this gif a million times and i had no idea that it was veronica mars i thought this was her playing a different role because obviously she looks so different here Um, She's certainly older than she was in Veronica Mars. So I was just assuming this was something else that I hadn't seen her in. So that was kind of fun. Um, But yeah, it's meant to really convey to us because she's out there in the lobby of this, uh, this legal office firm um, with a bunch of other people. So it's clear that this is a very sought after position and she should, you know, be very eager to take it. And in the interview, they bring up the variety of times that she has shown up in the newspaper, asking her about her history as an investigator. And she says that that's not who she is anymore, that she probably could have been called an adrenaline junkie. 
And then this dude brings up the sex tape, which I understand that this was done because they needed to address it due to the way the last season ended. But I would posit that this is a highly inappropriate interview question and that it would probably get them into some trouble. I think this would be a problem. Um, you like, there's just so many, so many lines that are crossed by actually asking her about this at all. Never mind the fact that it's been a, like almost a decade since that tape even happened. So it's so wildly irrelevant that the fact that they bring it up is just, yeah. And, but like I said, it's meant for the viewers because we're all still thinking about how that last season ended. And it just doesn't really feel like there was a good uh, resolution to that because she like figures out who it was and takes them all down, but the tape is still out there. And as we see later, people are still fucking like sharing it around and it gets put up on the projection screen at the reunion. So, you know, um, it's just such a weird thing, guys. I just, I wish so much that season three had been different because then this whole sex tape thing would feel so much more earned, but it, it's dropped in in the penultimate episode and then is like a centerpiece in this movie in a couple spots. And it, I just wish that they had done more to make it feel like that was something that mattered as much as it should matter. You know what I mean? Um, so anyway, she tries to handle it as well as she can. She goes and sees Piz after, and she's talking to him while she, while she gets a, um, text from Wallace, who is trying to get her to come in for the 10 year Neptune high high school reunion, which she categorically refuses to do until eventually they trick her into it, which is the most predictable thing ever. And it's kind of adorable that she did not see that coming. Um, and this, we see that Piz got a job on the radio, which is what he was looking for. There's a lot of like little moments of us seeing that people have sort of actually gone on to work in careers that they were interested in in high school which is one of those things that uh, when you watch this stuff as a kid, you really think that's how people's lives go. And as an adult, it's just astonishing sometimes how few people ever get to do anything remotely like what they thought they were going to get to do, even if they went to college for it. You know, the number of people who actually pursue careers in the same subject that they paid thousands of dollars for a degree in is just so few. And it's, it's shocking. Um, but of course in our fantasy land, everybody gets to do something that is right on target with things they were good at in high school. So as she's standing there and she's talking to Piz and his boss, there are a couple of TVs up and she sees a news story uh, pop singer Bonnie DeVille dead at age of 28. And this person, I believe it was Ariel, maybe Tori, um, somebody in the comments, because I asked whether or not we had seen this girl before. Uh, it, or no, was it Bonnie? Yeah, it was Bonnie. Bonnie was played by Blake Lively. No, Leighton Meester. Um, I think in the show. She wasn't a big part of things. And obviously they have a different actress for her in the movie, but she was around. She just isn't somebody that I remembered. Um, so she was found dead in her bathtub and Veronica recognizes her. Uh, she used to be Carrie Bishop before this woman changed her name. And we don't really understand the significance of this until they go outside and she sees a entertainment magazine with Bonnie's like uh, face on it. And she begins to look at all of the tabloid stuff about 
Logan and his involvement here. And the, wh- while she's checking all this out, by the way, there's like a street performer playing the theme song from the show in the background, like an acoustic version. And I was into it. I really liked the acoustic version, to be honest. I think he changed some of the lyrics a little bit because they didn't totally match up, but it might also just be from a different part of the song because you only hear that one verse, you know. Um, But let's see. Uh, Ariel says she was the girl who pretended to have the affair with that dick teacher for her friend. I don't remember that. I don't remember that. I'm sorry. That one slipped in my mind. It's funny too, because I think I would have thought I'd remember a Leighton Meester plot because I just really like her. She's just so pretty. It's really like gross. Um, but yeah, forgive me. I don't remember that plot line. But yeah, so in the bottom corner, uh, Bonnie's choice, movie star's son or music video director. And we see Logan Eccles and Sean Friedrich. I don't think we've ever seen Sean Friedrich before, but he's sort of a pretty boy. And later on, I think uh, we see Logan like yelling at him at the reunion. I don't know if he was also a a Neptune High kid, but I don't remember him. Doesn't really matter that much. Um, So the whole thing is basically that Logan was dating this girl. There are a lot of recordings of him apparently getting violent with people. Uh, And we see this one particular person that he like throws out and says, you're not welcome here. And if you, if he yells at Bonnie, if you keep hanging around with this person, you're going to end up dead, which is the kind of line that sort of frustrates me when it's applied in this moment out of context, you could say that means he's going to hurt her. But I think most people upon hearing a line like that are gonna actually hear that person is bad for you. And something is going to happen. If you keep on hanging around this person, it really feels obvious to me what is meant by that line. And so the, the way the media is and Sheriff Lamb Uh, asterisk, not the Sheriff Lamb, the way Sheriff Lamb is twisting it, it doesn't feel for me like most people would believe it. I think there would be a lot of conversation going on on social media and people would be agreeing like that doesn't sound like what was happening there. Um, Let's see. Rachel says, I think the teacher was Adam Scott. Veronica really liked him and was on his side until she figured out he was a creep. Oh, okay. This is ringing a bell vaguely. It was one of the few times her and her father disagreed because he took the girl's side. Right. Okay. Thank you guys. Yeah. I I don't completely remember it, but that's ringing bells. I know. I I think I remember. Um, New Sheriff Lamb says Rachel. Yeah. So this is Sheriff Lamb, but it's like his brother uh, played by a guy that I always think of as like dime store David Duchovny. I don't remember his name, but he was in the Scream movies, which Owen and I rewatched last October during Halloween times. And so that's all I can ever think of him as. Um, But he has the same like greasy, scummy quality that Sheriff Lamb had, even more so because Sheriff Lamb, there's a real feeling of stupidity to him and density And this guy, it feels like he's more intelligent, but he has a lot smaller of a moral compass. He genuinely leans into corruption versus Lamb, who just seemed to be incompetent, you know? Jerry O'Connell from Sliders. Thank you, Rachel. I only saw like a few episodes of Sliders when I was a kid. It was the sort of thing that like, I feel like I didn't know about how TV shows were scheduled. And so I would only catch it here and there. And I was obsessed with the concept of it. I loved the whole idea. And uh, I never went back and found episodes. And I've heard from a lot of people that it's a fun show to go back and rewatch. So maybe I should. 
But that was one of those ones that it was like a sort of sighting of Bigfoot whenever I would manage to catch it on TV. Um, let's see. Nancy says, Sean was the guy from the season one poker game episode. His dad was the butler. Oh, he reappeared in the end of the season when Veronica figures out how she got roofied at Shelly's party. Right. Okay. So Sean's a real piece of shit. And that's why Logan gets on him at this party. Um, yeah, we found Logan Eccles passed out next to DeVille's body. Sheriff, are you aware of the video of Logan Eccles threatening Bonnie? And it's just really funny because Bonnie's in the shot, but he like, or is that her? Maybe not. But he's assaulting somebody else. It's He's not threatening her. It's very clear that he's not threatening her. Yeah, no, she's in the shot and he just says, okay, you get rid of him or you're going to end up dead. And it's just so obvious what he actually means. And Sheriff Lamb says, kind of speaks for itself, don't you think? Mm, I don't think. And also, normally, a murderer isn't passed out next to their victim on the floor. You know, like, I'm just saying, that's irregular. And I would think it would raise some alarms over the fact that he's not likely to be the one who did it. It's, you know, come on. Um, so <laughs> Veronica's watching this. And of course she knows that Logan didn't do it. She just feels it in her bones. We see her the next morning in a like a waiting room again for Truman Mann, but there are fewer people here. So it's obviously a second interview and it's a pretty big deal that she's here again. And she's getting a call from Logan. And at first she ignores it. And then she t picks up the call and she sort of tries to be like, look, I don't do that anymore. And he has to be like, no, seriously, I'm just, I'm trying to find a decent lawyer I know that you are one. I really love when she answers the phone. I think it's that she says, so what's new with you? <laughs> Just uh, it's a fucked up thing to say, Veronica. <laughs> um, but yeah, can you just hear me out? And she says he's being bombarded by lawyers wanting to represent him. I'm just going to go out there, see my dad and help Logan weed out the shysters. And... Again, Piz is just so understanding, despite the fact that many people would not be comfortable with this at all. And I would understand it. I really would. You know, it'd be one thing if it's just, oh, she's going to see her ex. If you can't trust your person with their ex, period, that's a problem. But she's going to see her ex who is like on uh, uh, on suspicion of murder. He does have a violent history with you specifically and beat the shit out of you is clearly very possessive of Veronica because then he gets in a fight immediately afterward regarding her. And just overall, there's a lot of flags here that I would excuse Piz having a problem with this. Um, so she gets off the plane and Logan is waiting for her right there. I do appreciate them specifically addressing the fact that she that he had to get through security. So he had to buy a ticket to meet her at the gate because that's something that you could only do in the 90s and not anymore, suckers. Um, but yeah, he bought a $50 ticket to Palm Springs so that he was able to get in and greet her. And he greets her in uniform. Um, I don't know what this uniform is for. What is What exactly is this, guys? But he is, let's see, he says, I just met with the JAG Corps, fun bunch of guys. JAG Corps. I don't even, I don't know anything about. Um, and she says something to him about how he should always wear this uniform. I will just say, I don't like this uniform at all. Personally, I feel like it just, I prefer, Logan is so slender. He needs shit that's very fitted. Otherwise, it looks like it's hanging on him like it's his dad's uniform. Do you know what I mean? Um, Rachel says Navy. Jag is Navy lawyers. Oh, okay. Um, so, sorry. 
Ariel says, thinking how we know most investigations actually do, it really isn't that abnormal other than he's a rich white guy, not a normal black guy. Oh, like thinking about just the fact that he was passed out there and people are not thinking it through. I Yeah, I guess I see what you mean. Um, so even though I will say I am not a fan of the uniform, I will say, and I mentioned this in the live commentary, I am much more attracted to Logan in the movie than I ever was on the show. On the show, there were some moments where I really understood the charm and the charisma. And then all of season three and a lot of season two, he just seemed so toxic. He was lacking in ambition. He just didn't seem to give a shit about anybody. And I just find that deeply unattractive. You know, I don't mind not knowing what you want to do with your life, but I need to know that you want to do something. I I need to know that there is a spark in you of wanting to make yourself better and push forward and demand more of yourself. And I just, there, there was nothing like that in him. He was so complacent. And seeing him in the movie, he has a certain like, the the quiet, reserved thing that he had in the other episodes always felt like he was sullen. And that's probably exactly what was intended, because he's got a lot of trauma and was full of rage. The sullenness is gone here, and he feels much more comfortable and confident in a quiet way that despite the fact that he's being accused of murder, it it doesn't seem to rattle him the way you would expect. And there's something about that that sort of like, if I were Veronica, I would take it as a compliment. It seems like he is so certain she's going to be able to figure this out for him that he isn't panicking the way a lot of us probably would be. Um, so... There's several instances with him in this movie where I was like, damn, Logan, okay. Like, I I see it finally, because it was very frustrating to constantly see Veronica drawn to him and really just not get it. And I get it a lot more in the movie. Um, And he just seems like somebody who is more stable and reliable And that's part of what the deal was with him and Bonnie. He says eventually that it wasn't even like they were in a relationship. It was like he was her sponsor because she dealt with a lot of addiction issues and she was trying to get sober. Um, So that's a really unhealthy dynamic to be in with anybody. It's so tough when you are trying to help a person that you care about and you have to to figure out where your boundary is. You know, you have to learn when to say no and when you can help and when to cut your losses. If it seems like somebody isn't actually interested in getting better. And obviously, as we find out later, Bonnie was dealing with a lot of guilt And that's probably a major factor in why she started to use so heavily and drink so much. Um, So we will get to that, though. So then we get her uh, going to... Let's see, where's the first stop that she makes? Because I was like, I thought that she went to her dad's office. Is it? Yes, it is. But he's in a meeting, so she answers the phone for him. That's right. She can't help it. Um, And I love that she says, yeah, we will take pictures, but I'm afraid shooting the son of a bitch is not a service that we currently offer. And I love when she turns around and her dad makes this face when he sees her. Oh, my God, guys. I love Keith Mars. I love Keith Mars so much. Keith Mars is bae. Later on, he films some cops and I swear to God in this day and age there are some things that you look for in a man and being willing to film the fucking cops top of the list (laughs) (laughs) 
Oh my god. But seriously though, I really loved every bit of that. The only the only thing about this storyline that I didn't love is that the corruption within the cops doesn't actually feel like it's addressed. And to a degree, that's just reality. You know, like you can't just fix that. But I sort of thought there would be a little bit more done with it. And instead it just seems like we get a, the the sheriff being filmed saying that he doesn't really care if Logan isn't guilty. America thinks he's guilty and that's good enough for him. There's a thing with Weevil and I'll be honest with you guys. I didn't follow how that got wrapped up um, because, and I'll get into what happens with Weevil in a minute, but the, eventually they are trying to prove that the gun that was planted on him was already in evidence. And I didn't, I don't remember if they are able to prove that or if there's anybody that like is willing to come forward by then because spoilers, the one guy who's willing to say anything gets fucking murdered. Um, and so Keith almost winds up murdered as well, but it's an interesting moment. Um, when, they watch this cop who is, he's super gross. First of all, this dude is really shitty to Keith because of the fact that he got run out of office. And there's a couple of people who have been like stop and frisked. And, uh, it turns out that this is occurring because there's gentrification happening in this neighborhood. And when he says something like, what did you get these guys for? The guy says, oh, well, who knows? I'm sure we'll come up with something in an incredibly cavalier way. And then one of them tries to run and he uses a taser on him, which was just like, unfortunately, what we wish happened. But we know for a fact that most cops would have shot the kid. Let's be honest. And him standing there and saying, if you try and run again, I'll light you up like a Christmas tree. It sounds ridiculous. And yet we have heard this actual dialogue on film. Like it's everywhere. Cops talk like this because they are scum. And I'm sorry if you are related to or a cop yourself, but you suck. And so do they. And I do not have any reservations about that at all. You can't be part of it if you don't also suck and are a coward. So there it is. And this scene just really felt like, yep, in a way that's extremely bleak. Um, And we go to back to the house and have dinner. And Keith is just rhapsodizing over how well Veronica is doing. I should mention too, that there's an exterior shot of a house. The house is new, right? They didn't used to live in this adorable little bungalow before. Cause this is really cute. I really wish that I had a house that had a like little front porch like this and whatnot. Um, but yeah, He tells Veronica that she is destined for greatness and much bigger than she would ever have found here. And this is a continuing theme. He wants better for her than to stay in Neptune and keep doing what he has been doing. The fact that she's going to be making more money in the first year at this new job than he made in some of the best paying years of his life. He's delighted for her. And I really sympathized with him because I can imagine that all you want for your children is for them to do better than you were doing or are doing. And you're seeing them get set up for all of that and really thinking, oh, you're going to be okay. This is great. I'm so glad that like I as a parent helped set you up for success and it's paying off and I don't have to worry about how you're going to be doing in the future. And unfortunately... As a parent, you can do everything right and your kid is still their own person and going to do what they want to do. And 
you know, this is, it's an interesting thing because I had this a little bit, my mother has always been very supportive of me pursuing what I want in a career, but I think that she was very worried about me being financially stable and because she wanted to support me doing something that I liked as a career, she transferred her concern from that to my relationships. And so the first relationship that I was serious with, where I got engaged, and then we split up, she kind of defended him a little bit because she didn't want me to be on my own again. She was worried about me. And that sort of happened again once I divorced Brendan. And it was a weird thing where it was like, I know that you want what's best for me, but what's best for me is to like get out of this. But there is a deep fear there. And with Veronica's dad, it's like he, yeah, she's going to be making money. And I understand that that is hugely important. I'm not trying to pretend money is doesn't run everything. But you can just do something for the wrong reasons and wind up looking up a decade later and wondering why the fuck you did this thing this whole time. And I think it's pretty clear she's not super passionate about it, Keith, because she's not as excited about it as you are. And that's what seems sort of mystifying to him is obviously if Keith were in her shoes, he'd be jumping for joy. So he really does not understand why it is that she seems so ambivalent about it. And that comes up repeatedly is this feeling of frustration where he's like, I don't understand what the fucking downside is here. What is, what is the problem? Um, and it just, you know, like I said, it comes up several times. So there's a knock on the door and it is Wallace and Mac both of whom look amazing. Can we talk for a moment about Veronica Mars, like not being recognized by people when she looks exactly the same? Her face is a little fuller. Her boobs are a little bit bigger as Dick so helpfully points out, but she looks literally identical to how she has always looked. And yet there's this constant sort of like, Oh, Veronica Mars. Wow. And I'm like, no like she's nothing has changed but mac and wallace though first max hair uh flawless she looks so good she just pulls this off so so well i love it i love it so much and wallace looks amazing i mean goddamn First of all, he's always had kind of bad skin and his skin cleared up. He shaved his head, which I think looks a lot more flattering on him. He's got a goatee, which really works for him. And he feels like he's about a foot taller than he was and has like just overall really filled out. I was just constantly looking over at Wallace like, okay, what's up? Um, and there's a vibe between him and Mac. Are they dating or is it just that they're buds? They're just buds, right? Cause there was like, he says something to her at one point and she sort of looks almost like she's blushing and looking down. And I was like, is there something happening there or what's going on? What's up? Hmm? Um, and it turns out. Mac took a job with Kane Software. And she says, I know, I hate it. I do. I wish I was clubbing baby seals, but they just pay me so well. And I'm assume okay, yeah. Um, Ariel earlier says, I think they were hoping it to lead into a sequel or season four. That's probably what this is about. Because I was like, that's a real weird choice. But if they were trying to set something up for continuing the show, I bet that was the purpose behind putting Mac with them. Um, Rachel says, no, just buds. He's married, I think. Oh, I didn't remember that. Okay. Um, So, yeah, they're all hanging out. And uh, 
you know, eventually Wallace says something like, like, I can't believe that you just, basically, I can't believe you just totally dropped everything and came running the minute that Logan said that he needed you. Reminder that like Piz is the guy who doesn't have baggage or drama and uh, Mac adds almost never gets charged with murder. Um, and Veronica claims that's what she loves about Piz is that there's no drama. But obviously that is not what she like is looking for. It's just not. <laughs> Some people are like that. You know, for me, I have enough internal drama. I do not need external drama at all. I am constantly under a barrage of criticisms and insecurities in my own head, constantly trying to like improve the way that I live my life and approach everything. And I can't imagine trying to do that at the same time as deal with a bunch of like other people's garbage. So for me, the opposite. But if you are somebody who for whom daily life isn't its own drama, then I could see how you would need something extra. Um, so she goes to see Logan. And Dick is still living with Logan? I really, I cannot express enough my shock. Why? It's been so long. Dude, get your own place. What are you doing? What? I mean, look, I'm not mad about the fact just because Dick being in the movie works really well. But I really was like blown away at the fact that he is living in the same house as Logan at all. Um, so, yeah. He tries to act like he doesn't recognize her. Uh, Logan, that girl that follows you around is here. You get some work done? Your boobs look bigger. Oh my god, I hate him so much. Um, so, this is when they have the first meetup with a lawyer. And the lawyer is played by the little dude who does all of the tech stuff in Ocean's Eleven. He's like their, their hacker guy. And it's amazing how good he is at the sleazy lawyer thing. But the way he talks, uh, dad murders your girlfriend, mom jumps off a bridge. Most kids, they're going to fold tent, but not you. You sign up to fly jets over Afghanistan for your country. I say you're a goddamn hero. Some people, they see that viral video and they say, oh, he's violent. He's unhinged. I see it. And I see Jesus throwing the money lenders out of the temple. Hire me. I promise you. We will find at least one person on that jury who sees it the same. Who's in charge of your social media? And we cut to the end of what's clearly been a long day as he's saying goodbye to the last person. And they saw bloodsuckers all day. Clearly. This is so like... This is probably the first moment where I really began to be like, oh, Logan's working with something different here than he was before. Because there's no real flicker of anger from him. When he's sitting there and this guy is just rattling off some of the worst tragedies of his life, Logan's just calmly folding. He's got his legs crossed and is just sort of watching him in this way that feels very dispassionate and mature. Like, he's just letting this guy sort of run out of steam, seeing how far he'll go, because he has gone over these events himself so many times and probably been interviewed or, you know, just everybody knows about them, that at this point, it doesn't really touch him anymore. And because of that, there's just such a sense of maturity that I was really alerted in that scene specifically oh, he isn't the type that's just going to completely blow up anymore. Now, that's what I thought. And granted, I wasn't entirely correct because he does go ahead and blow up later. But I'm just saying. Um, so Veronica gives him some suggestions 
of which one of the lawyers she thinks that he should go with. And um, she says, our last content contestant did say something interesting. Part of clearing you will be finding a competitive, compelling alternative theory, which of course is, I have to go and investigate and find out what actually happened. But they decide to sort of leave that part unsaid because she's leaving in the morning and they go out for a drink to this place that does karaoke. And there is a girl here who was apparently obsessed with Bonnie and also went to school. Well, she didn't go to school with Veronica. She went to Neptune high and I guess she like ran into Veronica, but I think she was younger than her. Um, and this girl is there in like full Bonnie costume. Her name, she goes by like Ruby. Uh, and she gets up there and basically does a sort of imitation thing. And everybody knows her and is really tired of her and thinks that she's crazy, which she seems like she probably isn't well, to be honest. Um, and she eventually like goes up to Logan and is singing in his face. And I kind of thought at first that she was going to be implying that they, that she thought Logan killed her. I thought that she was going to have been so obsessed with Bonnie that she would defend Bonnie and be angry at Logan and assume what everybody else is assuming. But Instead, she is like certain Logan didn't do it, and she sh he shows Veronica a uh, email ten minutes after Carrie was killed. Um, every ending brings a new beginning. Now we can be together, and so this alternative theory really begins to catch Veronica's eye. This leads to her going to this woman's place. She pushes off going home and she goes to this girl's apartment uh, and under false pretenses gets herself let in so that she can steal some data, find out if the girl actually sent the email, look through her stuff and generally snoop around. Unfortunately, Veronica gets caught and they are about to press charges against her. And it's a pretty like serious situation. Her dad's really mad because obviously if, you know, she actually gets charged, like this could be, a, have a major effect on her future career. So eventually this girl, Ruby comes up and throws her arm around Veronica and acts as if they're BFFs to get her out of it. Because she wants Veronica to get her a date with Logan. Which is hilarious. Logan puts up with it pretty well. I'll be honest, I was impressed. Because if I were him, I don't think I could have restrained my disdain. I don't think I could have done it. But he was admirably resilient the entire time. So good on him for that. Um, and that is when they find out that she has a very solid alibi. She definitely can't have been the one that killed Bonnie, Carrie, whatever. Um, and there's also a conversation that happened before this all, right before she like tries to get into the apartment where Veronica is talking to Logan about how the footage could have, because there's like a tape of him and Bonnie having sex and it's really poorly placed. Um, it's obvious like that nobody set up a camera facing the bed specifically. It's catching just their legs. So somebody snuck something in, but they weren't in charge of exactly where it went. And this girl, Ruby, had been discovered hiding in Bonnie's closet at one point. So there's an assumption that maybe she planted a camera, but it turns out they're two separate incidents. Um, 
Ruby snuck in pretending to bring a flower delivery during a party and there were just too many people to keep track of and they didn't notice her going into Bonnie's room. As it turns out, the tape uh, came from a tablet that our good friend Vinny, he doctors these tablets so that they are externally controlled and send their data to like a central hard drive, I'm assuming. And then sends them to big events into, to get them put into swag bags for celebrities. So these celebrities, if they do indeed use the tablets and have them plugged in and charging somewhere, sitting up in their home, he will be able to access the camera and film them in the privacy of their home doing a variety of embarrassing things. And it becomes pretty clear quickly that that is the tablet that took film of Logan and Bonnie. And the monologue that Vinny gives, you guys, I got to find this moment because when she goes and tracks Vinny down at the beach, that shit is so funny. Vinny, first of all, because he says to Veronica, you've aged well. And I'm like, sorry, Vinny, but you really haven't. He does not look good here. He really doesn't. Um, But he says something about how, like, I'm trying to find the spot in. He says something about how nobody with, like, more than five IMDb credits can so much as pick a wedgie in their own backyard without me getting paid for it is an approximation of what the line was. And that was really good. That was some good writing. He's talking about how much they'll pay for just a photo of a celebrity eating and looking stupid while they eat bad beach body, you know, like all that shit. Um, and this is one of those things that I will frequently wish that I had the power and platform that a celebrity has. I'll, I'll, have this envy about it and then I'll think of shit like that and I'm like forget it man you know it's not even you don't even have to get to that level of things even people who have reached sort of a modicum of fame online they begin to get scrutinized more and I have no doubt that there are probably some really old tweets that you could dig up of me saying problematic shit and I could get crucified for that And this is not me railing against cancel culture. Don't get me wrong. Because like, if somebody finds that you said some fucked up things, then just say, oh, wow, I fucked up. That was a really fucked up thing to say. I'm sorry. I have learned better. That was super hurtful. I don't feel that way anymore. I don't believe that. And I'm really sorry. Just apologize, man, and admit that you fucked up and do better. Like, it's really not that hard. But people try and act like cancel culture. It's just like, well, because most people get defensive immediately and they expect everybody to just like, you know, there's this sort of like, well, everybody is so eager to cancel a person. And it's like, I don't even think that's really true. People are eager for a reaction. I think they want to see how somebody reacts to like their past getting picked up and pulled out. But I think a lot of people, if it's a celebrity that's like built up some goodwill, actually they incline more towards wanting to forgive. And it's up to that celebrity, whether or not they're going to apologize in a way that sounds sincere and makes sense or not. And, you know, sometimes not everybody will forgive you. And that's just part of what you have to deal with when you fucked up. Nobody owes you forgiveness. Nobody owes you to keep listening to your music or watching your movies or whatever, you know, but this sort of thing is different than like digging up old tweets. It's just filming and, and photographing people who are just living their lives like regular people. And then that being like fodder for entertainment. And that is the shit that I cannot imagine having to live with. I really just don't know how they do it. It has to be exhausting To feel like every single time you step foot out of your house, whether you're on your own property or not, there is going to be somebody 
looking to cash in on you. I can't imagine, you know? And then there's people like Cher, who there's multiple photos of her, and she's just wearing a full, like, green mud mask, going out and running errands on the street, wearing her mud mask, not giving any fucks. And you know what? Maybe I should live my life more like Cher, because her skin is still flawless. I could probably use some tips from her, to be honest. Anyway, I was just delighted to see that Vinny was back. That's it. I was really happy that he was part of things again. So we're going to have, there's this moment where Veronica gets in the car to go home, supposedly leaving in the morning yet again. Of course she doesn't, but she gets in the car and there's this monologue. Um, she sh- she says, we should take the long way home. And you see him sort of look at her in this way. And then they're crossing a bridge and there's this music and this lighting. And she's sort of gazing out and he's turning and looking at her. And she has this smile on her face that's like total contentment. Um, And she's just thinking about how, you know, do I, she says, do I get a chip for this? Pouring the drink, swishing it, smelling it, leaving the bar without taking a sip. Is this what getting clean feels like? And it's just, again, a really fucked up dynamic to like write into your script, but then have her go back to him. I I just don't understand what it almost feels like the writers are acknowledging that this is a bad thing. Is that what's going on? Do you think that they're in agreement with me actually that they're like, this isn't good for her, but guess what? We don't always make decisions that are good for us because that feels like what they're saying. And if that's the case, then I, I kind of appreciate it. I don't want her to be back with him, but if we're going to have her go back and we're going to be like, and it was a bad idea, maybe I get it. Maybe I'm, maybe I need to give him a little bit more credit there. Because that feels like, you know, I started off the episode being like, I don't understand why you would do that. But it never occurred to me that they don't want her back with Logan either. So if that's true, then this is pretty interesting. I don't know. You know, like, what do you guys think? Um, so anyway, we have her in the morning getting ready. Dad coming in obviously wanting her to head back to New York, be a big shot lawyer, talking about how she's going to have her own office. And she keeps arguing again about how it doesn't matter. He has his own office, yada, yada, yada. There's just a lot of her digging in her heels and not really wanting to give him the satisfaction of landing any of the things that he is claiming are going to be great for her. It's, I hate it because it's just such an unspoken thing. He knows, he knows, and he's trying so hard still, but he can tell like, she's just not invested in this. Um, Ariel says, Probably and maybe slyly telling the fans that shipped them that we are also messed up, which, yeah, <laughs> that's actually kind of good. Um, all right. You know what? I like it. If that's what they're doing here. So Veronica goes and answers the door again, thinking that they're just going to go out to some place. Mama Leone's for lobster, I guess. But when Mac and Wallace show up, they are dressed to the nines and she has not caught on to the fact that. And I love, what is it that Keith says? He says something like, um, shit, where is it? Uh, oh yeah. So let's mull this over while we're wearing lobster bibs. And they both look at her and her dad chimes in when number one daughter was young, her skills were sharp, like blade of sword. Now brain dull, like blade of plow. And she's like, she says the foot. And I'll say, she says uh, fuck in this episode. Oh, my God. I forgot to talk about this, you guys. Look at me. Look at me. I'm a mess. The club. The club. The club. 
How did I not talk about this? You guys, when Ruby goes on this date with Logan, they go to a nightclub and Veronica has to be by herself for a bit. She's trying to give them some space because Ruby obviously doesn't like her. Ruby reminds her at one point of asking Veronica what she could do to get onto the dance squad at school. And Veronica's response was dance better. Um, which honestly, like Veronica wasn't on the dance squad. Was she like, I don't remember if there's context given as to why she asks Veronica, but nevertheless, it is a bitchy response, but also like, I mean, yeah. Um, so yeah, Veronica's trying to give them some space and there's a series of different dudes who hit on her. And what's really fun is that they're all actors that I recognize from other like comedy stuff. But one dude, I think one of you guys said in the comments on the Facebook page that one of those guys is actually her husband. Is it the one that tells her to smile? The one, uh, this guy was also in Brooklyn Nine-Nine and really liked Pilsners, I think. He was obsessed with Pilsners. Um, Rachel says yes, okay. Uh but the series of different types of hitting on that happen, it, it's such a beautiful montage. There's, first of all, the guy who says that you made my friend come in his pants, but also he thinks you're cool. He's a nice guy, really, though. And she just says, fuck off, which is really exciting to hear Veronica get to use the F. Then there's this dude who's like a, a hedge fund guy who is talking about how he could fly her out to his place in Napa or something, then asking her, give me a smile. Just give me a smile. Is you, what, what are you here with your boyfriend? What does he do? I'm a hedge fund guy. Is, what, is, what does he do? Um, oh my God. Rachel says, not the smiler. Sorry, the dancer. Oh, the dancer is the guy she's married to. He's so ugly. I'm sorry, but he is. Bitch, what? Oh, I am really hurt in my heart right now. Because, yeah, that last guy is, like, doing the sort of, like, hip thrusts. And at one point he does, like, the tongue thing. And it's truly revolting. I mean, hideous. I wonder if they were married by then. Were they just together by then? Or <laughs> did they meet on set and his tongue thing just really got her? Um... But yeah, like, oh, yeah, no, Ariel says he's an actor as well, just not in as much as her. Yeah, I recognize him. I definitely have seen him in a bunch of things. And it's all been comedy, I'm pretty sure. But he's not cute. Um, oh, my God. All right, there's a photo of them together at the Golden Globes. <sighs> he's better looking here. I just can't get over Like, look at how flawless she is. And this man literally looks like he wore that suit to bed. I don't understand how men can get away with it. I really don't. I really don't. Oh, I'm so irritated now. All right. Well, I just wanted to mention that whole montage because it is so funny and it's so well done. And I, they really covered most of their bases with that. Uh, Rachel says they got married in 2013. Okay. And this was, this came out in 2014. So they were married by now. Okay. 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 Um, so coming back to going to the reunion, uh, we've arranged for Piz to fly in our gift to you. So they're sort of strong arming her into going, even though she swore she wouldn't. And this whole thing, it turns into her ditching Piz and all of them periodically, despite her claims that she likes them because she wants to collect information about what happened on the boat, the, what was it called? Serendipity, I think. Um, so there was a tattoo that Bonnie had, Serendipity, which turns out to be the name of, uh, I think, her father's boat, which is what gets Ruby thinking like, oh, it was her father that did it. And she got the tattoo to let us know before she died. Like, girl, what are you talking about? I really enjoy Ruby as a character because she's just bonkers. 
Um, but eventually it all begins to come together that this girl disappeared while a bunch of people were on a boat called the Serendipity. And Veronica starts to realize that people are like, do you know what happened? Even though everyone's acting like, oh, we just woke up from being drunk and she was gone and we don't know what happened, but we assume she fell overboard. Somebody, more than one somebody, knows what happened and they got worried because they could see that Bonnie was starting to crack. And it would make a lot of sense that Bonnie's starting to crack when she's also starting to get sober. Because that's what happens. Part of getting sober, if you're following a 12-step program especially, but usually just even in therapy, is you begin to have to like confront demons in your past and things that you don't want to like remember or talk about or admit to. So once you start getting clean, it becomes part and parcel that you begin making amends to people that you've hurt and facing up to wrongs that you've committed. So probably trying to keep her drunk was part of also trying to keep the secret. And then people began to realize that she wasn't going to keep her mouth shut. And so they had to do something about it. This leads to the resurrection of the character Gia, who is Kristen Ritter reminder. Um, I had always sort of wondered what happened with her after Veronica like outs her dad as a pedophile, as she puts it. And she says something about how I realized that I had a lot of misplaced anger towards you. That was actually projection of anger that was really directed towards my dad. Um, doing the the thing that she does, which is sort of like oversharing and being a little bit too effusive right out of the gate. And she is engaged to this guy who is the son of a, I think U S Senator or congressperson. And there's like a sort of trophy husband vibe to it. That's very gross. And later on we find out that she is sleeping with somebody else, but it turns out she's being raped basically like, she does not want to be with this dude, but he has blackmailed her into it. And the guy that she's going to be marrying is gay or bi, but there's a, there really feels like there's the subtext is that he is gay and she's his beard. Um, not even subtext. I think Veronica just straight up uses the word beard at one point. Um, so let's see what's, Nancy says, Susan, the one teacher, Adam Scott impregnated. I don't know what you're referring to. Is Susan, Susan's the one who died. Sorry, guys, when you're listening, I realize that you can't see the comments. So when I stop and like reference a comment, you don't know what I'm talking about. But Nancy left a comment. And I'm just not entirely sure. Because sometimes I won't read it until I've bypassed a subject. And then I'll go back and realize like they were talking about something from earlier. Um, Ariel says, yes, she's the one who died. Okay. Um, so Gia is like, you know, at saying to Veronica that we should definitely hang out sometime and being very friendly. Of course, Veronica has no intention of doing any of this, but as she begins to, uh, put pieces together and spy a little bit more on Gia, she, comes to first of all figure out that Gia has the tablet that was Bonnie's in her possession and Veronica figures this out by she stalks or stakes out she stakes out is a nicer way to say it Gia uh watching her from across the way in her like huge loft apartment and I appreciate that at one point she specifically says, I'm not even allowed to have curtains um, because of this dude. So it sort of gives us an explanation as to why we can just see straight up into her apartment. Um, but Veronica goes over there after she sees that, what's his name? Cobb comes over and she sees that Gia is sleeping with him and she assumes that Gia got Cobb to kill Susan and 
motivated him using sex to do it. I don't remember if she has a motive, like a motive for wanting Susan dead. Um, I don't remember what reason she came up with for that. But she comes over and pretty much just straight up accuses Gia of this. And this is one of those things that I always find frustrating because probably if this were to have been the case, Veronica would have been taping the whole conversation with Gia. But at the time, it just feels like Veronica walking up into a murderer's house by herself, accusing them of murder in a place where she could be killed and there'd be no evidence or you know, like the only person that knows she's there even is Logan. And depending how it goes, there's no way to necessarily hold Gia responsible for that either. I just think any time that you were going to either blackmail somebody or confront somebody with the knowledge that, you know, they did something that they would be ashamed of and desperately want to hide. You don't want to do that in a location that is private and, you know, where nobody knows what it is that you are up to. Um, so they say, Ariel says, Susan died on the boat. Bonnie is the one Cobb killed in the bathtub. Okay. I must've gotten their names mixed up in there somewhere, but I don't even remember what I said. My bad. Um, but I don't. So she confronts Gia about it and tells her what she thinks happened, which is that Gia used her lady parts, as she puts it, to control Cobb and get him to kill Bonnie. Okay, so she didn't... Her theory isn't about Susan. Um, what does she think... I don't know if she even knows about what happened on the boat at that point. I don't know if she's put that connection together. I think she did, did though, right? She thinks that they want to keep Bonnie quiet about Susan's death. But I don't know if Veronica has a theory about Susan's death specifically and why it happened. I don't think she does. I think she just comes in here to talk about Bonnie and sort of is waiting for Gia to fill in the blanks, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but Gia basically immediately cracks and tells her exactly what happened, which is to say Cobb was obsessed with her also kind of a creep and really elbowed his way into their social circle because of the fact that he had good drugs. He had access to them, which is something that happens. Um, I have seen this many times, somebody that everybody doesn't really like, but they are able to get drugs or alcohol consistently. And so they are allowed to all the parties, even though ordinarily these people wouldn't be caught dead socializing with this person. And he comes like invites himself basically onto this boat party, which uh, I really enjoyed Dick talking about it. We all got hammered because it turns out partying on a boat is super boring after like 15 minutes. I have never partied on a boat. I, for me, I would think it would still be really fun. You can jump off and swim and climb back on the boat. If you've got a ladder, I think that'd be fun, but evidently not. They're very spoiled. You know, they don't understand. Um, but Cobb comes with them. And evidently, Susan was a lightweight and she overdoses. But Cobb tries to reassure all of them. It's nothing serious. She's going to be fine. And that he's seen it a million times before. And then they wake up in the morning. Or they don't even wake up in the morning. It's like in the middle of the night. And she, they, some of them wake up and she's dead. Or they come back and find her dead because she like maybe went below. Dick, it's very specifically mentioned, is like asleep for all of this. So he genuinely doesn't know this happened, which is just another notch in the whole we're going to pretend Dick isn't a piece of shit like bedpost that the show has going on. We can't like let him be aware of all of this. He has to be the babe in the woods who has no idea what happened because we need him to still be likable for some reason. Um, but regardless... They panic. Cobb convinces them that they need to toss her body overboard and weigh it down with an anchor. And when they do this, 
he takes a photo and they don't notice at the time. But later on, he sends them all a photo and uh, like a copy of it, letting them know that he now has like complete control over their lives from here on out, basically. And so that is how he is sleeping with Gia. He's blackmailing her into it. And Gia's soon to be husband was the one who actually carried out Bonnie's murder. He goes to her house and at the same time, Gia is at the club, which is lining up her alibi using uh, Bonnie's tablet to send a message to Logan saying that she's thinking about going to a bar and breaking her sobriety in order to get him to like rush over to the house and thus setting himself up to look like he's the murderer. So Gia confesses all of this. And as she's standing at the window talking about it, she just gets shot in the heart. It is truly shocking. You guys like, it startled me so bad. It was a really good moment. I thought this was really well done. I also appreciate that when Veronica calls 911, she tells them that a cop was shot because she is trying to actually get them to move their asses, which I thought was very significant. And I liked that detail. Um, So she has to escape and there's this long sequence of her like hiding in a cupboard and him slowly going through. And he turns on a song at the same time, I guess to cover up the, like his footsteps. So she won't be able to hide from him as easily, but uh, it certainly does add some atmosphere. (laughs) And eventually she like distracts him by calling the cell phone that's sitting on the the table he turns and looks she flips open the cupboard and like tasers him in the leg and then pepper sprays him in the face it's very satisfying honestly and she is finally able to flee out of there um i don't remember if she does she just leave him there is he like i don't even remember what happens after she gets away because i was just so focused on her escaping alive that I don't even recall how that all went now that I'm thinking about it. Um, I'm going back and looking at the section now because she goes downstairs thinking that she's in the clear and he uh, has padlocked the door that she came in on, I think. So she uses this uh, cat as a distraction, which I thought that he shot the cat in the garbage can and I was extremely agitated about it. Um, But let's see. Oh, yeah. She bashes him in the face with something. I don't know if it was a a golf club. That's what it is. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, But we cut right from there to her uh, saying goodbye to Logan and also her with her father. And it was sort of a weird moment where I really wanted to see the cops arrive and her explain what happened. I was a little bit bummed that we don't get the whole like unfolding of the story and the, you know, justice of it all. I I really thought we would get a little bit, but we don't really. Um, So in the midst of all of this, she had her breakup with Piz. And honestly, his acting in that scene, I thought was excellent. He's so, it's so subtle where he's very hurt. He's also so angry and he's really trying to like hold it in because his parents are right here. And this is kind of humiliating honestly i loved that um and then she's saying goodbye to logan because he's like going he's being assigned somewhere for i think he says like 180 days something like that and she goes and visits her dad in the hospital and he's in there by the way because he got like taken aside by the one decent cop who is trying to tell him about all of the corruption in the police department and somebody driving basically a fucking like tractor just crushes the car and turns around and comes back for another hit. And Logan is able to get Keith out of the car in time, but he's pretty badly injured and the other dude is dead. Um, And like I said, there's not a lot that like, 
gets wrapped up there, which probably is part of them trying to continue the show or get another movie going or something. And there's a story that I haven't really touched on uh, because I am so, so bad at time management with my episodes. But Weevil, first of all, he is adorable. He looks much better in this than he looked in season three. And he's married now and has like a three-year-old daughter and is a family guy. And then he is on the way home from the reunion. Actually, I don't even think that's it because he would have been with his wife. He's doing something else. And he comes across a car that is like being harangued by a bunch of bikers who are evidently meant to be part of the gang he used to run with. The PCHers. And he gets out of the car to try and like assist the person. And I remember that she was a named character, but I can't remember who she is. She freaks out and shoots him. And the cops, because he's like passed out by the time they get there, plant a gun in his hand. And she claims that it was self-defense and that he threatened her. I am assuming she was motivated to say this by the cops that they like sort of cajoled her because otherwise I don't really know. It doesn't seem like I feel like she could have claimed self-defense anyway without trying to make it like he was actually there to hurt her. She could have just said, I thought he was one of them. I didn't mean to, you know, and it's not like he died. So she wouldn't, it wouldn't have been a manslaughter charge or anything. Um, But regardless, when he gets shot, it was really shocking. I got so upset. Um, Oh, my God. Rachel says it was Duncan's mom. Oh, my God, you guys. I did not realize that. I hate it so much. Christ's sake. Ugh, Duncan's whole family is absolute trash. Um, So, yeah, they try and frame Weevil. And it's just at the end of this movie, in conjunction with Veronica giving up her, like, you know, bright five star job and her very sweet, no drama boyfriend. We also have a shot of Weevil getting on his bike again after having told her proudly that he hasn't gotten back on his bike in like eight years or something or five years and that he owns his own shop. Like he's doing really well and super proud of the fact that he is doing better and managed to straighten out. And then this one incident, he she says something to him about how apparently somebody is more afraid of, like, the police department than they are of Weevil. And that's why they are, you know, keeping this this facade going. And he says something like, well, let's see if we can do something about that. And we see him get on his bike and head out, I'm assuming, to harass whomever it is into recanting their version of the story. And it's a really sad moment because he has really managed to put it all behind him. And because of this fucking like bullshit racism, class war garbage, it's his like life has, they've attempted to flush it down the toilet. And the only way for him to defend himself is using the tactics that he's been trying to escape And it's just really sad, you guys, honestly. It was very depressing. I was so happy for him. He's like, he's effervescent when he gets to see Veronica at the reunion and show her how well he's doing and everything. And you're so happy for him. And then this, it's just, uh, kills me. Um, so that in conjunction with her deciding to like go with Logan and stay in, in Neptune, it just really felt like a downer by the end. Um, so that's why I say that it was like a roller coaster. Cause I was very enjoying things, but because of it just feeling like everybody sort of reverts, it seems hopeless. You know, there's a sort of fatalism to it, but if they were intending to try and resurrect the series, I guess it makes sense that they would go this way rather than try and give everybody happy endings because then where do you go from there? Um, So, yeah, but I did like, I liked it like a lot more than I expected to. So that's good. And, uh, 
it was just really great to see where everybody is and the actors like have all aged so well. I think I mentioned Cliff is there initially to maybe defend her when she thinks she's going to get in trouble for breaking into that apartment. And even Cliff looks great. He's like aged way better. And just, I was just like, well, damn, what's up with you too, Cliff? Like everybody looks good. The only one that didn't age well is Vinny pretty much. Um, and that sort of lines up with his character who seems like he's fallen on hard times, you know? So I guess he had been, he must have gotten elected mayor, but I don't remember what could have happened there. I don't know if they mention it. I don't know. Um, anyway, so I'm over time here and I'm going to have to wrap it up, but thank you again so much to Rachel and Ariel for commissioning this. I really appreciate you. Um, and this was, a, it, I'm really curious since there is a fourth season and a fair amount of time passed, like, what was it? Six years between this movie and the fourth season. I'm super curious how they're going to approach this now. Um, are we picking up with everybody where they were at the end of this movie or are they going to do another couple of giant shifts with things, you know? And I hope to God season four is one cohesive crime mystery instead of a series of them like they were doing with season three. We'll see. But uh, I'm going to look and see actually when the next one is. So season four, the first episode is on May 28th. I don't see here any other episodes listed. I don't know if they've been commissioned and they just haven't been added to the crowd cast or what. But that's the only one that I can see from here. Um, maybe on the spreadsheet, there are other ones, but hopefully that, uh, Emily says there are two books that take place before the fourth season. Oh, I'm not going to read those though. I'm just going to be jumping into the fourth season. So hopefully it's not like absolute required context. Um, Rachel says, I think we thought we'd see if you like the tone season four takes. Oh, Okay. Okay, well, season four is going to be Friday, May 28th, so it's coming up. And then after that, if anybody does commission it, it'll be, uh, you know, it'll be a while before the next, like, episode two. But uh, Rachel says, if it starts and you hate it, we weren't going to make you watch. Okay, I'm very curious uh, why you guys are so cautious. It must be kind of a dramatic change if you're that worried about it. Hmm, very curious now. Um, all right, guys. Well, thank you again. And I will be seeing you soon with the first episode of season four. Until then, toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.